Thank you, Larry. I don't have a, uh, a formal presentation uh, for this afternoon other than to talk about deregulation. Uh, deregulation, I don't even know if most of you know what it means. It means choice, but why the choice? In natural gas, what it meant back in the mid to late 80s, it deregulated. It meant separating the transportation side, which is the pipeline, from the actual commodity. So you could buy your commodity and then buy the transportation from the pipelines, basically. And prior to that, pipelines uh, would, set, would basically give you a regulated rate. They would buy the gas from various places, put it in their pipeline, and then give you a regulated rate at the, uh, at the end of the day. Then also with uh, natural gas, um, oh, just to give you an idea of some of the savings GRU realized, because I actually worked as a natural gas buyer back in 1991 when it first deregulated in Florida. Um, the regulated price was approximately $1.50 to $2 a decatherm higher than the price we purchased at. We had the option to either go buy deregulated or to continue to get regulated gas. Once we made the choice, we were sort of stuck with it for the next uh, five years while it slowly deregulated. So that kind of money, if I remember correctly, uh, we were purchasing approximately 20,000 decatherms a day. So that's anywhere from $30,000 to $40,000 a day we were saving GRU at that time when it deregulated on a wholesale basis. And that went directly to the consumers because that's passed through to the consumers. What's that? Allegedly. Allegedly. Well, fuel cost is a pass-through to the consumers. I mean, uh, the transportation side, they can do stuff, but from what I understand, the fuel cost is a direct pass-through. If you pay too much, you're going to pass that through. If it comes down low, you'll pass that through, too. <clears throat> um, So uh, that deregulated in the, all the way through, I think that was uh, right through 1990 is when, when the industry finally deregulated on the natural gas side on a wholesale level. Uh, in 1998, um, on a retail side, uh, Atlanta Gas Light decided to deregulate up in Georgia. And they did a complete deregulation, meaning they said, I'm no longer going to sell a consumer natural gas at all. Uh, I'm only going to provide the transportation of natural gas. They spun off a company called Georgia Power, excuse me, um, Georgia Natural Gas, and that's their retail arm. And then they had um, also the, uh, their own Atlanta Gas Light, which collected money from the various marketers in their, in their service territory. Uh, Infinite Energy was one of those marketers. That's the company I founded with my partner, Rich Blazer. And what that did was it allowed consumers an opportunity to purchase natural gas from, at that time there were 13 different suppliers as opposed to, depending on whatever Atlanta Gas Light purchased the gas at, would be passed through. Why is that more efficient? Um, it's more efficient, first, you have competition. But second, what incentive does Atlanta Gas Light have to pay for the lowest cost? They could. They, they, their incentive is, hey, I get to pass through this cost. So there's really no incentive to do a good job necessarily. And they'll tell you they did. And, and, you know, they try to do their best, but they're not necessarily on a day-to-day -day basis going out there and, and doing that. Secondly, um, with the deregulation of any market, um, you get a number of advantages. You get the competition, which is a big advantage. But secondly, you get, if you want it, price certainty. Now, I don't know how many of you are businessmen out there, or women, but if you have a low price with certainty, you can lock in your rate of return, basically. We can, we can for instance, we've sold uh, into the future up to 10 years at a fixed price so that a business can lock in their certainty. Um, and on the other side, what we do is we mass all of the various, whether it's a residential or a business or whatever, we mass all that into one buying group, so to speak. We buy for all of those at once, and we buy out into the future through the commodities markets. So we hedge ourselves, and what 
The difference is, is our profit margin, basically. But being able to offer that price certainty sometimes is even more valuable than the lowest price. Because when Katrina hit, earlier this morning I showed a graph. Maybe you could show that graph for me again Wait, if you uh, want I'll, I'll talk about it while he's uh, uh, doing that. Um, gas prices went up from, uh, we would say, an average of about $3 a decatherm to $4 a decatherm. Ah, here we go. Thank you. That's the one I want. <clears throat> the one that's up there right now. That's the very top one. Okay. Yeah, let's see. Thank you very much. Okay. So you see that here's where Katrina hit. Here was the gas price prior to Katrina and afterwards. More than doubled from $7 a decatherm up to 13 Now, if you had no price certainty, say you were behind GRU right now, GRU doesn't necessarily go out and buy gas ahead of time. They'll buy it month to month for the most part. So Hurricane Katrina hits, all of a sudden they're going, they're paying instead of $7, they're paying $13. Well, what's that do for a business? All of a sudden, if business is using natural gas at all, they are paying the pass-through cost of 13 plus the transportation that GRU charges. So can a business sustain for this small period, and this is about three or four, you know, almost uh, six months of very, very high prices, can a business with their cash flow sustain during that period? A lot of businesses are hand to mouth, so to speak. They can't do it, you know. So without deregulation, you're subject to these high peaks. Now say say um, we locked your price down at eight. Now that's higher than most of this market. I'm not saying actually we would be able to lock your price down basically on this curve right now. But say we say it was even at eight. Now that would be higher than the average over time. Say we did that for five years. But perhaps you're making a 10% rate of return at eight dollars. If it goes to 13 it puts you out of business. So what's the better alternative? It's having price certainty. Now the good thing is, is that we wouldn't have locked you in at eight. If you would have locked in here for the next, say, five years, your price would have probably been right around here. So that's one of the, in my opinion, one of the biggest advantages of deregulation is certainty. Why would a business want to gamble on something that they don't know anything about? In other words, just, you know, I talked about rolling the dice earlier with um, GRU. Well, why would a business want to roll the dice on what their energy cost is going to be? Why wouldn't they, you know, you have several components of running a business. You have your labor cost, which generally is fixed and can be predictable. Uh, you have your operating uh, plant cost, which is generally fixed and predictable. The other one, in general, if it's not deregulated, unpredictable. So if you could tie down the third pillar of your cost, so to speak, the energy side, you pretty much know what you're going to make over, say, the next three to five years. That's the main advantage as a, uh, uh, to deregulation, in my opinion. Now, um, on the electricity side, we also, have, oh, uh, if Florida does have deregulation a little bit on the natural gas side on a retail level, uh, and that's basically behind the privately owned investor utilities, uh, whether it's TECO, Tampa Electric Company, or um, uh, NUI down south. The municipals uh, do not have it, okay, uh, with uh, a few exceptions. Lake Apopka has it. Uh, and I think Okaloosa allows one of their people to, to buy their own, own gas. So, um, and GRU of course does not have it. And it's only for businesses uh, on the ones that do have it. The other, um, we think that the Georgia model has been extremely successful with the complete deregulation. It's allowed consumers to price certain uh, their uh, natural gas choices out to five years. Um, as the market falls, they will continue to enjoy those benefits. Uh, also, um, I'm going to talk about now electricity deregulation, which is very similar to natural gas. Once again, you're taking the product, the producer of electricity, separating that from the transmission, which is the power lines. 
So it gives you the option to buy your electricity from whoever you want. The state that has the, like Georgia, has complete deregulation is Texas. And they did that about 10 years ago, if I'm not mistaken. It's 2001 or 2002. Um, right now, they're enjoying some of the lowest rates in the nation. To give you an idea, if you were here this morning, we were talking about um, a little bit on the biomass uh, plant, and that was going to be approximately $130 a megawatt hour for 30 years, I believe. Right now, you can lock in for uh, uh, at least one year. You could lock in, and this is as a residential. You can get even less uh, less cost as a commercial account. You can lock in at basically $61 a megawatt hour. It's the lowest in the nation. And the thing is, you can lock these things out even further. It's a little bit more expensive to lock it out further, but you have that option to do that. Um, other states that have deregulation, New York, uh, New Jersey, California, Texas. We're the only big state not to have deregulation on the electricity side. Trying. Governor Scott is um, in favor of it, uh, but Obviously, I don't think the utilities are in favor of it at the moment, which to me is somewhat odd because if you do it correctly, they will be able to make more money. For instance, when Atlanta Gas Light deregulated, I told you they had a, uh, the deregulated arm, Georgia Natural Gas. Because of that, they are one of the most profitable per capita companies in the nation from a distribution standpoint, distribution company standpoint. So because of Think of it prior before, the natural gas cost was purely a pass-through. They now have a deregulated arm that can make money on it. That's why. Um, let's see what else I have here. Just looking at my notes. Oh, one of the other cool things. Um, innovation, obviously, is a, is a big bonus for deregulating any market. For instance, we offer literally millions of different products. If you're a company and unsure as to what prices might do and you, you think it's a little high right now and you don't want to uh, lock it in or lock all of it in, we can allow you to lock as little or as much in for the next five years. You could lock in 20% of your portfolio in, 30%. If whatever you wanted to do, we will allow you to do and then you could float with the market. And then when you felt the prices were where you wanted it, you could lock in the rest of your portfolio or another percentage. How in the world would somebody like GRU handle that? It's just, they're just not set up for something like that. It allows um, you know, buying power. Say, if you're Burger King and you're all over the state, you can you got a lot of them, and if it's deregulated in the state, you can use that to your advantage. Does as as everyone know what a smart meter is, or does anyone have an idea what a smart meter is? Okay. A smart meter is a meter that shows your power usage on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, and is able to transmit that power usage to the grid, so to speak. Why is that important? It's important because, well, let me let me back up a little bit. I'm going to say, do you do, are power prices the same at night as they are in the day? No. In fact, sometimes at night, sometimes at night the power prices are negative. People will actually pay you to use electricity. Well, where a smart meter is important is as a consumer, whether you're a business or a residential you can time when you want to use certain things. For instance, you've heard of the green uh, the smart dishwasher, for instance. It can run at night, but if it runs at night, it's going to save you money based on your profile. If you are a business and are a manufacturer, all of a sudden it behooves you perhaps to run a night shift because the power is so much cheaper at night. So you want to bring manufacturing back to the United States, what if your energy cost is next to zero because it's running at night? Okay? 
These options we don't have. What is our price? What is our price from a regulated utility? What is our price for it's, it's what your price at midnight is the same as your price at noon, correct? They may offer demand side where they'll they'll say, hey, we'll we'll cut off your air conditioner, say at 4:30 or something like that during peak, and you get a little bit of a savings. But they're not really giving you the option to control your own destiny as far as the power that you use and when you use it. That is a huge advantage to deregulated markets. We're going to be starting to do that shortly because Texas is going completely smart meter in Texas. So we're going to be all able to offer all those products within the next six months. To Texas, not to Florida, unfortunately. <laughs> Our previous speaker, Tim, mentioned, uh, showed high living standards for certain countries, mainly because they have good electricity, basically, that they use a lot of electricity. Cheap energy is what's gotten our country to where it is now, for the most part, along with a free enterprise system in general. To continue to have cheap energy, I think you need to look at the deregulation, because it will push innovation, it pushes price certainty, and with those things, with price certainty, cheap energy, and the entrepreneurial spirit our country has, I have no doubt that we'll continue well into the future as being best country in the world. <laughs>